downrange of Bald Wool, once the stately home of William Randolph Hearst, situated midway between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the Enchanted Hill is a magnificent artistic creation. We've been here for several days with guide supervisor Sally Scott on tour, and we're going to be talking about the mystery and the story behind San Simeon. Sally, let me ask you the question that's been really behind all the time here on tour. Why did he choose this location? What was here special about this hillside spot? Okay, in order to see the total picture, would you go back in time with me about 130 years? Okay. And we'll get to that question, okay? Sure. Let's go back to 1850, because that's when it was, it was the time when his father came from Franklin County, Missouri, to the California coast, well, all over the west coast, actually. Now, now you, Look, that's George Hurst, That's right? George, okay. yeah. And he's looking for, uh, for gold with the thousands of other young men out here. And he wanders around for about 10 years mm -hmm. until he and two other men invest $450 in a poorly producing so-called gold mine. Mm -hmm. But what they know and the original investors don't is that uh, unidentifiable ore that they're tossing to one side is silver. They have purchased the richest vein of the Comstock silver load. <laughs> now you say everybody else was looking for gold at the time and yeah. they found the silver well, load. Well, yeah, they were doing it. Yeah, so yes, they did find the sil that silver. And George went back at that point, all three men wealthy. George went back to Franklin County. He met, courted, and ultimately, uh, ultimately married an 18-year-old school teacher named Phoebe Apperson. They moved to San Francisco, and in 1863, their only child, William Randolph Hearst, was born. Well, Phoebe decides that she's going to dedicate herself to the pursuit of educating her son. And she takes him on trips to Europe. And in fact, they're in Europe for about a year and a half. They're traveling with a uh, tutor from Harvard. Mm -hmm. And this is the story you like, where uh, uh, they, uh, they're they in the Louvre, and he asks his mother to please buy the museum <laughs> for him. <laughs> but uh, and it really, if you think about it, that's an amazing request from a 10-year-old boy. But she instills in him this desire to collect art that goes follows him throughout his 88 years. Oh, then his 1919, his mother dies. And that's when he gets the bulk of the Hearst family wealth. And that's when he writes to his architect. And he said, uh, says, I'd like to build something more permanent at San Simeon. Well, it, the situation here is that when his father started buying the land up here, mm -hmm. they used to come up and uh, ride horseback all over these 240,000 acres. And then uh, as he grew up, they camped up here. And in fact, they called this Camp Hill. And then his father built a big ranch down below, and he built a wharf down mm -hmm. there. So there was, there was time spent so here. So his father had, had actually used this for uh, William's childhood. It was pretty well cent centered right up here well, on the hillside. Well, not centered, but they vacationed here periodically. One of some of his most favorite periods absolutely, of his childhood. Absolutely, absolutely. Fond memories of this place. Uh, and then just before construction, or just before his mother died, he, start, he put uh, big tents up here, great mm -hmm. big canvas-covered tents with mm -hmm. wooden floors. And uh, he'd entertain up here. Uh, they tell of one time where he put a great big movie screen outside and showed films at night up here. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the first outdoor driving. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So anyway, but 1919, he wrote to, the, to his architect and said, I want to build something more permanent on Camp Hill. So that's when they began the construction of the guest houses. You know, all the building materials were brought down here by coastal steamer and then laboriously hauled load after load to the top of the hill. All the construction material, all the topsoil, uh, cement, whatever was needed to build, had to be brought to this particular spot. this person? Yeah, and that's Julia Morgan. Julia Morgan is the architect, the for, architect for this area. Absolutely. She was the first woman to graduate from the University of California at Berkeley with a degree in civil engineering.
She has over 700 other buildings to her credit, as well as working here on the hilltop almost the entire 28 years with Mr. Hurst. Are any of these buildings as famous as uh, San Simeon? She helped redesign the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco after its earthquake in 1906. I think I heard that she was instrumental in building the Iwani Lodge, the Iwani Hotel Absolutely. in Yosemite Valley as That's well. That's right, I and, forgot And about. I've been, uh, the Rangers, uh, another state park is also a Silmar Conference Grounds right that's up in right. Pacific Grove. I believe her name is on that building, too. It's amazing, you know, to 700 buildings, that's a lot in anybody's lifetime. I have understand many of the, the buildings here, the, the pools themselves, they were done and redone and redone again. There's sometimes three or four different <laughs> times that they were done. The pool alone, I yeah. understand, is the third yeah. pool. It is, it is. Yes, uh, the first was a little cloverleaf pool that Mr. Hurst decided was not large enough. So it wasn't a matter, well, it's not a matter of starting all over again, but mm -hmm. he enlarged that to um, just about the size of the inner oval of uh, the dark bird antique right. that she, that about the size of the second pool. Which is still a nice sized pool. Well, pretty good size. And then it was uh, the third pool that he built that became the 104 foot long pool that we see today. But you have to think that he had these huge pieces of art that would dwarf a pool that wasn't as large as the one he ultimately built. Mm. The fog's starting to come in and I want you to see the Neptune pool in the sunshine. Okay, let's go to it. This is the Neptune pool. Isn't that something? It's magnificent. It's lined with marble from our own state of Vermont. That's pure white marble, too, even though it looks a little blue. So that, that is an illusion of blue there. Yes. And then these pillars that we're walking by, the colonnades, they're too from this, our own state of Vermont. I didn't realize The white Carrara marble at this point was commissioned work. It was done by a man named Charles Cassou, specifically for the pool. Mr. Hurst built this entire system the same time he built the Neptune pool. There is nearly a half a million gallons of water being filtered through this, this five filtered system here. It filters through sand and through porous concrete. We even have stalactites and stalactites. Watch your head, Bob. Okay. The Roman pool is lined with Venetian tile, and the uh, gold in the design, that's 22 karat gold infused between the Venetian glass tiles. This is something that you have to remember all the time. Mr. Hurst had these fantastic craftsmen working up here. He'd have an antique that he wished to display, and then they'd build a set around it or incorporate it into a building or a structure mm -hmm. in order to make a total perfect whole. The gardens, I understand, are very central to the concept of San Simeon itself. How did, the, how, how did he feel about the gardens? Well, well, you have to think about the hills and how barren all of these hills are. There's no, there are no trees, a few scrub oaks and that sort of thing. And on this hill, there were a few of the big 200-year-old California live oaks. And every once in a while, one of those trees would be in the wrong spot. When Mr. Hurst went to build something, he didn't cut down a tree. He, he moved it. <laughs> they'd build, they'd uh, build a great big cement pot around these trees. Then they'd dig a hole the same uh, depth and mm -hmm. width and pull those trees over inch by inch. So the root systems wouldn't be destroyed at That's the same right. time. That's right, and they are still on this hill, and they're still growing, and they're, they're fine. It's a beautiful framing device against the castle themselves. Absolutely, huh? absolutely. You know, another thing we have to go back and think about the time span here. In 1919, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hurst was 56 years old, and mm -hmm. that's when this project began. So this is not a young man's <laughs> no, uh, it isn't. Uh, project. No, and instead of bringing in little uh, three-foot plants or foot-high twigs and planting them, no way. He brought in big, fully established trees. Yeah, and that's another thing to remember, the symmetry and the balance and all of that which is taken into consideration. I mean, nothing's just set somewhat place without rhyme and reason all there to, to display it in its very best. Well, take the statuary, for instance. He has a setting and a place and a, a perfect uh, background for each and every one, uh, one of those statues. He was involved in having the gardens just right. He planted thousands of rose plants in over 80 different varieties. <laughs> Look at the roses, they're magnificent. Aren't they gorgeous? Mr. Hurst was creating a Mediterranean style garden and putting these Carrara marble pieces right out in the middle. This graceful little girl feeding the goat was done by Cuvier. 
There are many of these uh, Carrara marble statues as we walk along the Esplanade. A great many of them were commissioned work in the 20th century. This is a piece by the Romanelli brothers. This is a uh, Carrara marble carved piece of Europa. Uh, Zeus is at it again because he's changed himself into a bull and he's going to carry her off. This particular piece was carved by Fritz Ben. I love the setting of the roses like that, too. This is one of the favorite pieces uh, among the guides, this little La Petite Fond. Look at his horns and the pipe and the cloven hooves. Yeah, right, Isn't right. he precious? All of the marble out here in the gardens is indeed Carrara marble. That's the marble that comes from the quarries of northern Italy. It's the whitest, the purest of all marble, and the same marble used by Michelangelo. Mm. This is Venus washing her hair. One of the most uh, frequently found miniatures that one can find in the souvenir shops in the area is this piece of the Three Graces. That's Brilliance, Joy, and Bloom. The original was sculpted by Antonio Canova, but this one happens to be a copy by Boyer. Uh, was there a master plan for the whole design, or did it just kind of grow uh, and, and keep getting revised as he went along? Well, there was a master plan. You can still, to this day, see a, a complete model of this entire place as to where everything is as it is today, pretty closely, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, and there, he had a total idea of what he wanted. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. did, he, um, uh, did he want to uh, build more? Is this the total extent <laughs> of, of his uh, design? No, he had, oh, he had lots of plans, lots of plans. It was never ended. I think the best way to explain how Mr. Hurst, uh, how all of this came into being, is that he saw this, maybe he never used the word, but he, it was a hobby. He was collecting, he was displaying, and he was gathering these things as one would a stamp collection mm -hmm. or a coin collection <laughs> or anything else. This was his hobby. And to uh, and it, a hobby, you never you're never completely finished with a hobby. You can always add to. No, as far as we know, he had plans of building this huge ballroom that would have been around in the back where the wings come out to one side. He was going to line that with tapestries. There are those who believe that he his ultimate plan that the indoor Roman pool would have in some way been connected to the main part of the house. Because you know there was a time when this was the entertainment spot, certainly on the west. Coast, and he brought the Hollywood crowd up here. That's right. With Marion Davies up here, that was a, a, an introduction to the Hollywood set, and he had the studios as well. Absolutely. So, what type of guests would you uh, normally find on a weekend up here? <laughs> I think, uh, well, they're, uh, you know, everybody. Uh, I know uh, John Hall came at one point, and he took pictures of everybody who have, was happened to be here that particular weekend, and we have some wonderful footage of them. And it kind of, when you see these films, it gives you an idea of how much fun they were all having. And they did. They're, you know, they're around the pool, or they're walking off to feed the animals, or, or just walking through the gardens. And we have pictures of Cary Grant, who was here, as well as Luella Parsons, and uh, Louis B. Mayer, who was a guest, and and, uh, as well as some excellent shots of Mr. Hurst. Um, I, you know, it was part of the whole um, scene here that everybody was having a good time. And you can tell in these movies uh, very often that they're here just to have fun. Which kind of leads me to the guest houses themselves. They're, they're spectacular Mediterranean-style buildings. Uh, could you tell us something about each one of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that uh, A House, La Casa del Mar, uh -huh. Mr. Hurst stayed there. He, all, he stayed there until construction was far long, far enough so that he could move into the, his floor, his quarters on the third floor. But he did stay in A House. In fact, this is a guest house. These are really guest rooms. But there was a time when Mr. Hurst used this house, he preferred to use this house, and when he did, he made this particular guest room his office. Mm. Julia Morgan and Mr. Hurst were not only involved in the architectural aspect of the construction here, but in the interior design as well. In this room, in, in all of the guest houses, in fact, Julia Morgan designed the ceilings. Now, once they were installed, men would lie on their backs on scaffolding and apply the 22 karat gold leaf. Look at all of the faces in this particular ceiling. This isn't the only gold in the house. Where do you see the fixtures in the next room? Okay, let's go. 
Here are the gold fixtures I wanted you to see, Bob. Mm. Even the um, holders here and your glass holders. Look at the little band of gold around the soap dish. It's all gold plated, included these little birds on the faucets. And of course, that's marble. And then they picked up the color of gold in the marble. The legs are gold. Mm. In fact, even the plumbing under the sink has been plated gold. Oh, amazing. <laughs> This is Mr. Hurst's bedroom in a house, and uh, this is the canopy. Now that, of course, is all hand embroidered, and that's red velvet. This bed has been extended. Mr. Hurst was better than average height, as you know. A composite of uh, pieces went into making this particular bed. This is a Florentine piece from the 16th century of the Madonna and Child. And over here, a cope. Now, this is a religious vestment worn by uh, a bishop in the church. This one, however, comes out of the 15th century, and it came from Venice. And then, of course, you've got Bee House, which is a La Casa del Monte. Mm -hmm. And that is strictly on one level. In fact, there are only uh, four bedrooms in that house and a sitting room. Mm -hmm. And the reason, or, and that's one of the reasons it was the most popular of all the guest houses, because people really did like that cozy bungalow cottage feeling that they had in that house. It was no doubt one of the favorites of all the stars and definitely one of the favorites of David Niven and he, who he was a guest oh. here. He tells kind of fun things about being up here. In fact, he's written two or three very good right, books. Sellers. Oh yeah, excellent books with a wonderful sense of humor. But uh, he tells stories about having come up here and and he was most frequently the guest of one of the sons, or all of the sons. They were his age group, and they, they were, the, were friends. And I guess we've heard enough to know that Mr. Hurst um, controlled the drinking habits of his guests. He wasn't about to let a bunch of teenage kids come up here and drink too much. And I think that's fine. You know, he I think didn't it was want the, the Hollywood parties to get out of hand, more <laughs> or less? You bet. No reason why he should put up with that, and he mm -hmm. didn't. So he tried to control the ha drinking habits, as I said. <laughs> but there were times when they tried to circumvent the rules. There's no doubt about it. They were here to have a good time. Right? <laughs> yeah. And David Niven looks at, or at one time said that he looked back on some of this and wondering if maybe he would have done things differently if he'd been more mature. But <laughs> at this point, he did bring up a case of scotch. And he tells about it in his oh, book. But I think what's funny, yeah. But what's funny is he remembers walking across the main terrace, popping mouth mints in his mouth, <laughs> knowing that in a few seconds he had to meet Mr. Hurst. Uh -oh. <laughs> and he was uh, hoping that Mr. Hurst didn't know that there were scotch bottles beneath Cardinal Richelieu's bed. Oh, brother. <laughs> which brings us to another story, though. Uh, there is a beautiful uh, hand-carved, great big, huge bed that has long been referred to as the Cardinal Richelieu bed. Uh, it probably was not uh, ever carved it wasn't or that made sacred. for yeah right for the car, uh, for the cardinal, but in fact it just it uh, happened to be identified as such over the years, which does happen. Uh, somebody said that looks like the Cardinal Richelieu bed, and it stuck. Uh, regretfully, <laughs> uh, I wish it were his bed or had been or whatever. So um, each I think is, I suppose each guest house has uh, has its own story. There's there's no doubt. Um, but as I say, uh, La Casa del Monte, or Bee House, was one of the more, uh, more popular. What do the motifs mean? You said Casa del Monte, which of course is House of the Mountain. Right. And Casa del Mar? Mar, the sea. House of the Sea. And Casa, what is the third one? Casa del Sol. Okay, that's the sun. Face is almost directly west, so that you have the view of the setting sun each Are evening. those motifs carried forth in the decor as well? or? Uh... Are they just uh, symbolic of the houses? I think they're more symbolic of this place in which they are situated on the hill, okay. as far as I know. What do they mean, anyhow? What do they mean to Mr. Hurst? Well, this is, uh, remember, this is Mexican land grant country mm -hmm. that his father had purchased. And you're obviously going to have this tremendous Spanish influence. Mm -hmm. And it's the heritage of the area is going to trickle down into the names of the very guest houses. Of course, then you have La Casa Grande, the big house, right. and La Cuesta Encantada. The Enchanted the Hill. Enchanted Hill. <laughs> uh, the guest houses seem to imply that only the that was the only place where the guests were allowed to stay. Did they have rooms for the guests up in the La Casa Grande, the yeah, main right, house, right, too? Right, absolutely. 37 bedrooms up there. We've talked about that. That would fill a few yeah, guests, right. wouldn't it? <laughs> so, yes, there was the cloisters. They... You have the cloisters, okay. that area where you have bedrooms one after another, all identified like a... Uh, 
uh, the cloisters in a monastery mm -hmm. where the monks have little cubicles. These That's are right. little more That's than right. cubicles, uh, rather large, elaborate bedrooms along the cloisters. And then, of course, um, the doges, that mm -hmm. beautiful, that main suite that, that we saw. That was for dignitaries. That was kind of, yeah, VIP suite. This is the suite where Winston Churchill stayed when he was a guest. You know, I think Mr. Hurst really captured the essence of the Italian Renaissance in this room. Mm -hmm. Almost everything here is indeed from Italy. The painting is from the school of Tintoretto. Oh, it's a beauty. These are called Majolica ware. The two on the outside are 17th century mm -hmm. pieces, but this is St. George. That's from the 1600s. The colors are so vibrant, they're mm -hmm. gorgeous. The tabletop is also Italian, 1600s. Mm -hmm. The little girl is from Florence. Mm -hmm. That has an alabaster shade. Of course, gold leafed, but isn't everything? That's magnificent. <laughs> I love it. This is a bambocci. That's an Italian desk. Mm, look at all that carving. Italian chair. That's called a scabella chair. Mm -hmm. It was used in a time when ladies wore those big hoop skirts that came out at the sides. They couldn't sit in a chair that had arms in them. They had to have a chair like that. <laughs> <laughs> the fireplace, that's 1600s. A family once warmed itself. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. in the 1600s. 300 years ago. Above that, a, a piece of Della Robbia mm -hmm. circling a bar relief of the Madonna and Child. Oh, the Doge suite was very much a VIP suite. Calvin Coolidge, George Bernard Shaw, Winston Churchill, they would have stayed in these rooms. In any given year, how many months would he actually spend up here at San Simeon? Uh, good question, because of course it, it changed all the time. The okay. first years when construction were going on, you know, that, that was not something else, mm -hmm. and maybe just a few weeks, and then it became more and more. This, you have to remember, was the favorite of his seven homes. He had, uh, and he wanted to stay here. This is where he wanted to be. There's no doubt about it. This was his favorite. This was his home. This is where he'd grown up, and he had his mm -hmm. good memories. Plus, this is where he wanted to entertain his friends. But he had seven other homes, and he was there some seven of the Seven others? <laughs> seven other homes. He had a huge house up in uh, Northern California, the foot of Mount Shasta, with the McLeod River going through and the mm -hmm. guest houses on either Along side. The river. Yeah, oh, right. My God. And then, of course, he built Marion Davies a uh, uh, 100 room, what they call beach house. 100. <laughs> in Santa Monica, and then, of course, he had a huge place in, in New York, and, uh, and then he had a castle. He had a real castle. Not in America. Not in America, but uh, outside of Cardiff in uh, Wales, a place called St. Donats, and that's a, another story, you know, a fantastic place. And, of course, he was displaying his art in each one of these homes. But this is the place where he had the best memories, and this is where they seem to have the most fun. Uh, what would a daily routine look like up here? What was the, the, the way the, the people would uh, meet each other and go through a day? Okay. First of all, Mr. Hurst's invitation to you was always to come to the ranch. Okay. And it was a very informal invitation, and he wanted you to come up here and enjoy horseback riding. He wanted you to play tennis in mm -hmm. either one of the, uh, on the two tennis courts. You could swim in either of the indoor or the outdoor pool. Mm -hmm. He had a billiards, billiards table and a complete library for his guests. They could do just about anything they wanted. Now, it seems that about mm, maybe 7 or 8 o'clock at night, okay. he would ask you to come to the assembly room. Okay. And uh, Adler Roger St. John's, who worked for him and was also a guest here frequently, said they called it the Great Hall. But mm -hmm. then, you know, it's a huge room, I suppose. <laughs> it's actually the largest of 14 sitting rooms, but it's also the living room on the hill. So you would gather there prior to dinner for your cocktails. And that would be the first room as you entered the front of the castle itself. That's right. And this is a Gregorian chant book, the uh, large writing enabled the entire choir to read from a single book. Over in the corner is a piano. Can you imagine, say, somebody like Hoagie Carmichael sitting down and playing Stardust? Mm. <laughs> On top of that is a Tiffany lamp that's all silver with cloisonne insets. And there's a jigsaw puzzle. That was kind of a big way to pass the time of day in the 30s and the 40s. They were very popular here. That particular one happens to be titled The Sidewalks of New York. <laughs> The ceiling is made of walnut. It was once a ballroom ceiling. In fact, it was in the Palazzo Montenegro in Brescia, Italy. The medallions have been inset into the wall more than a foot. Each one weighs better than a ton apiece. The large paintings on either side of the fireplace, one called the Annunciation, the other the Crucifixion. The fireplace um, 
once sat out in a field in France until it was cut up, put back together like a huge jigsaw puzzle. Mr. Hearst was buying tremendous quantities of art off the auction block, and French, French and Company gave him as a gift the presentation casket on the middle table. You know, what looks like uh, glass is really hand-cut, hand-polished rock crystal. Then pretty soon a man would come to the door and announce that dinner was served and you walked into what Mr. Hurst referred to as the refectory. And this is that huge dining room uh, with those long refectory tables. I've been anxious for you to see it. You know, when we leave the Renaissance assembly room and walk into this, the refectory, as Mr. Hurst called it, or dining room, we're stepping back architecturally speaking a good 200 years to this period of art when all the lines were vertical and it automatically raised your eyes upward. And I want you to look at this ceiling. There are 13 full-size standing saints that 400 years ago were looking down on monks when they were eating in their dining rooms. Mm. And the monks had to sit at refectory tables, which are just like these. Only they would put the tables against a blank wall and the monks had to sit on these hard wooden benches. They were discouraged from conversation. They had vows of silence. But Mr. Hurst used the narrow refectory tables in order to encourage conversation. And he put full two feet tall silver candlesticks out on these tables, right next to ketchup and mustard bottles in their own store-bought containers. Amazing. He put the condiments out every fourth place setting. I wonder if he was remembering the good old Camp Hill days. Or was he teasing the Eastern establishment just a little? <laughs> but more silver. A piece of Sheffield. This is the only piece of plate in the room. It's a warming dish. A mace from Dublin, Ireland, a symbol of authority. And a wine cistern. Now that's the Queen Anne design, designed by David Willems. Mm. Once belonged to the Baron of Bewley Castle. We think that he probably added the flags in this room for the additional color that they give. They're part of a festival held twice a year in Siena, Italy, called the Palio della Contrada. <laughs> the original were silk flags, but now they're being kept uh, in safely in the basements. And these are copies that are out now. This is a bishop's banner. Now, this would have been held or carried in a religious processional so that the crowds on all sides on the street could have told where the bishop was in the procession. It's not all silver. It has gold medallions. <laughs> Choir stalls, 600-year-old choir stalls from the Cathedral of Urgell in Catalonia, Spain. Mm -hmm. But this is the back wall of choir stalls mm -hmm. where they would allow the very elderly of the monks to stand. Because once this seat is raised, a little hip seat appears. So that the monk, with his long robes, he could get back into these little cubicles, mm -hmm. appear to be standing, but in fact was resting. <laughs> the church said, that's okay. They called them mercy seats. Mercy. <laughs> And this is part of the Daniel set. Here Daniel is interpreting the dreams for King Nebuchadnezzar. But you know it's fun to go back four, five, six hundred years in history. But Bob, it's fun to do something else, and I want you to play a game with me. Okay. It's fun to go back maybe 55 years in time, when this was the, the uh, entertainment spot on the West Coast, and he had all of the uh, Hollywood crowd up here, as well as men and women who were making headlines in his newspapers. And I want you to pretend with me that we can see a guest list that all of the people were here, but probably not all at the same time. And let's begin by putting Greta Garbo over there, okay? Across from Rudolph Valentino. <laughs> Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, across from Douglas Fairbanks. Let's put, mm, how about Clark Gable here, across from Carol Lombard. Olivia de Havilland, Vivian Lee, Leslie Howard, uh, across from David Niven. And let's, Mr. Hurst always sat in the very center of the table. And across from him, of course, Marion Davies. Bra Bernard Baruch, George Bernard Shaw. Oh, uh, let's see, who should we put here? How about W.C. Fields across from Marie Dressler? <laughs> Marie Chevalier, oh yes, he was a guest. 
And let's put pretty little Colleen Moore right here. She's the little girl that bobbed her hair in the 20s and the flapper's hairdo was born across from Adela Rogers St. John. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Bob Cummings. Joel McRae tells us that he sat at this table at the same time that Amelia Earhart was sitting across from Charles Lindbergh. Calvin Coolidge was a guest, as well as Charlie Chaplin. He was here so often, some tell us, that they called him the court jester. And Bob, I want you to sit right there. Now do you believe me when we call this the Enchanted Hill? No, like, no, no. This is one of the most magical, one of the most, the great fantasies ever brought to life. I don't think anything exists uh, on the same scale anywhere else in California or has ever been achieved in California history. No. You know, you talk about scale. You've seen the kitchen. Can you imagine? Here's this a fantastic kitchen. It's like, it's like a, an hotel kitchen. It's that large. With Monel, you know that shiny stuff that looks like stainless steel? That's uh -huh. really all Monel. All of those warming tables and that long um, pantry. Uh, area and then of course he had the rotisserie which mm -hmm. it seems to me that he was ahead of his time on that and those huge pots for you know uh, cooking gallons and gallons of soup or whatever oh. at the same time and uh, he had uh, he had quite a kitchen staff but then you know knowing that he had these other estates he could draw uh, help uh, from any one of the other places mm -hmm. so that if you had an unusually large crowd here he just brought in help from any one of the other houses so how, there were a lot how of people. many people could he actually um, um, sequester or put in rooms here and, and feed at the same time well we figure pretty close he probably had a, a maximum of a hundred at any one time at any time yeah. that wasn't the norm he'd come up here with a half a dozen people two dozen people you know it, it varied uh, now Cary Grant tells us that he was here uh, three days and it was just um, uh, Marion and Hurst and himself sitting at that huge dining room table, you know. <laughs> and we've heard others say that they would be here all by themselves. He was running at one point, literally running uh, his, um, his empire, his businesses from this hilltop. He had a teletype machine, a, uh, you know, the uh, telegraph, a complete switchboard so that he had contact with his businesses from this hill. Mm -hmm. This is Mr. Hurst's private library, but it's called the Gothic Study. This was his office. There are 3,500 books in this library alone. So he actually had another library in the building as well. Yes. There's a library downstairs that has over 5,000 books. He, was he interested in a particular subject or everything under the sun? Everything under the sun, I think, is probably a good way to put it. Actually, he was writing a daily editorial. He needed all the books in order just for research. There's so many things in this room. Uh, what are they? <laughs> That's a good question, and it'd be tough to answer. But let's look a, take a look at a few. This is a pineapple cup from Russia. That's a drinking cup. And the top comes off to put the wine in? Yes, it does. Here's a Hanap a drinking cup from Germany. That's hand-carved ivory. Gold and silver pet tankard here, a reliquary. You know, every time you see anything that looks like gold, it is. So these are the real things. They're not fakes. <laughs> not fakes. If it looks like silver, you can bet it's silver. Amazing. Oh, and don't forget to look at the murals in this room. These were done by a man named Camille Salone. He worked for Mr. Hurst for oh, over 17 years. Every, every part of the ceiling is covered with something. Yes. Some of those murals are old stories out of the Bible as well as mythology. And don't miss this. Remember that huge Gregorian chant book that we saw in the assembly room? Right, yeah, I did. This is a page from one of those books. That's made of goat skin. This was Mr. Hurst's conference table. Mr. Hurst sat here. You know, he had editors coming from all over the country. He held conference business meetings up here. The Hollywood crowd never got to this level, and none of the guests did for that matter. This wasn't an intimate room then for no. his people then. No, no. He was busy. He was running 94 separate businesses. I thought he was just a newspaper man. <laughs> Not quite. He had newspapers, all right, but he had magazines, radio stations, movie studios. He was very powerful. In fact, at one time, he made a telephone call from this room that released the delegates and ultimately nominated Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. You're kidding. I didn't realize that at <laughs> it's all. It's amazing. Oh, Bob, I want you to see something most unusual. 
This portrait of Mr. Hurst was painted when he was 31 years old. And his eyes, if you watch them, will follow you as you cross the room. So by the time Mr. Hurst died in 1951, and his sons used the place for about mm -hmm. six years, but again, that era of big parties and the lavishness and all this, it had passed. And so his sons weren't using it. And they recall that his father had requested to his friends and relatives prior to his death mm -hmm. that he would like the people of California to have some way of appreciating this hilltop. People have come from all over the world that any year that's over 15 million um, tourists, visitors have come through and that we're at 965,000 visitors each and every year. Nearly a million a year. Nearly a million this a year. This is since 1978, 58. 1957, it was 57. deeded over and in 58 of June of that year, the first, it, the first tours went through. Amazing. And I, you know, another thing, I, nobody really realizes what a, what a big business this is. We have 150 guides taking tours through on three, set, four separate tours during the summertime, every 10 minutes apart. I understand there's more than one. Uh, well, the first tour takes you through the main floor of the house mm -hmm. and through the, uh, into one of the guest houses and then you see a movie in the theater and you see both the indoor and the outdoor pool. The second tour takes you uh, through the upper quarters where Mr. Hurst's private rooms were, where the guest library mm. was, the doge suite right. and the, the celestial area, the celestial suite and all that, uh, those private, be you know, mm -hmm. private bedrooms plus his private quarters, the Gothic study. The third tour takes you through that area that was pretty much finished after Julia Morgan has left. Well, I say that, oh. the interior was finished. Both wings of the house were built, you know, almost all together, all at mm -hmm. the same time. Then, in, um, after the war, they started working on the new wing, on those new uh, bedrooms. So, so the design, the architecture, the style, everything has changed. Mm -hmm. And there's almost a 20-year gap in there that you can see how these rooms have changed. Anyway, that tour takes you to, through one of the guest houses, too. In fact, that's where you see the so-called, quote-unquote, Cardinal Richelieu bed. <laughs> And uh, then you have the tour four, and that's really our garden tour. But mm. this takes you through that uh, hidden step uh, terrace area that that's, I talked about. That's the fourth tour. That's the fourth tour. And then you get to go all the way around the esplanade, see all the garden area. And then the uh, one level of uh, La Casa del Mar, one of the guest houses, plus that area where the vaults are. Mm. After I've been on several of the tours here, I'm really impressed with the high caliber of the tour guides and the tours that they give here. Thank you, Bob. I couldn't be any happier with any statement because I totally agree. The guides come out each and every day and perform minor miracles as far as I'm concerned. I think when someone comes up and just happens to go out on a tour, they're unaware of the responsibility that tour guide has. It's amazing what they can accomplish. And then to manage this whole group, keep everybody happy, entertain those, entertain and inform and you know manage all of this in a single time, and they do that, uh, three or four times a day. I noticed uh, on the tours themselves that uh, the tours rarely get to see uh, the other tours. You have several tours going simultaneously. Good point, good point. There are times when there can be as many as 600, <coughs> 700 people on top of the hill, mm -hmm. and yet you see 
no one outside of your own immediate tour group, mm -hmm. which is great because they have, the place is so large that we can run tours 10 minutes apart and yet nobody sees anybody else. They think they're up here all by themselves, which is, is nice. Oh, but there's a miracle worker behind all of this, too. Uh, Irene Horn is the supervisor of guides at Hearst Castle, and she projects three, four, five, six months in advance how many people are going to walk up to the She knows our, just <laughs> what to expect on any given day. Well, you know, that's, that's part of her job, and she's been doing it for almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. and the woman is a genius. Her percentage is like 98% on the head. You know, she really is amazing. It must be an enormous task to maintain a place of this size. Uh, I can give you a logistics problem that will stagger your mind. Now, imagine that this house, uh, with the main house, you know, over 100 rooms, mm -hmm. plus uh, the guest houses, and you'd have to add up, uh, what, 8, 18, and 20, or whatever. All of those rooms must be at least dusted every single day. Sometimes, every day? Uh, sometimes Wait, they dust them in the morning, because when you have traffic going through, a, any house wife will tell you this, you have traffic <laughs> going through a house all day, it makes more and more dust. And here we're, we're putting 5,000 people on, this, on the tour every day. So the dust is created. So they go in and once or twice a day dust every piece of furniture in the house. In fact, that's one of the things when a tourist comes up and says, this place is spotless. Mm. So, and of course, there's, there's a fabric repair. Mm. Things just, just get old. And we have women who can do that dainty work. They work with microscopes and lights and daintily uh, repair. That's right. We saw some going on down the preventative maintenance program. Absolutely. Program. I watched them apply this 22 karat gold leaf to doors. And if really, it's done so perfectly. And then they, they work together in conjunction with the maintenance staff. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of overlapping of responsibilities and a lot of working together, as you would imagine, mm -hmm. for a place this size. And the maintenance staff comes in and they do uh, various repairs, whatever mm -hmm. needs to be done. They're constantly working with the electrical system That's and right. the plumbing system. And you can go right on down the line of what these fellows must you're almost like a self-contained small village up here with all the, the skills and the Abs abilities up here to maintain this place. Absolutely true, no doubt about it. And then we have, we have our, the collections department. That's another whole section. This is behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, very much so. Who are responsible for many, many aspects of um, the entire running of this place. And one of the things that collections has been able to do for us through the years is gather more and more information, and which is great for the tour guide, because as their information comes in, we have more and more to add to our tours, and more, and we can, more sophisticated knowledge and information that and all of this creates the, the whole, and, right. and it's at So there's one point. ongoing research all the time here, and the tours are constantly changing and evolving right. as, as you find out more. Absolutely. Uh, of course, Ann Miller is head of all of this, mm -hmm. and she has worked on this hill since she was a little girl almost. Really? <laughs> she has. She worked for Mr. Hurst. So you have some of the original people who worked up here and knew Mr. Hurst at that time. Absolutely. She was here at the same time he was. And you realize how wonderful that is because she can say, hey, wait a minute, I was here. I know how this was done or I know who was here or what. And it's a, what a, a wealth of, yes, wealth of information, absolutely. And we have another woman who has done a remarkable job with our oral history program. She has written to literally hundreds and hundreds of persons who were at one time guests up here or maybe they worked on construction up here and they give us insight that are just unbelievable. And when you say oral history, you mean you actually tape record their conversations and as they reminisce? Uh, yes, exactly. And they love to do this. Oh, this place has I so many good memories for so many people that once they, you get them on tape, that you can't stop them. They're so excited about talking about Hearst Castle. So uh, we have to, a lot to thank uh, Meta Haik for uh, uh, her involvement in getting this information to us. She's the one that has, um, that was directly responsible, solely responsible for getting us the John Hall film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the Office of the State Architects. Uh, they perform their uh, own miracles, too. Now, if something falls apart, mm -hmm. or it's just plain old and it uh, no longer is serviceable, say a balustrade, maybe one of those little uh, mm -hmm. balustrades, a piece in there, a pillar, they'll go out, they make a mold from a good one, mm -hmm. and they actually make another balustrade just as Mr. Hurst's craftsman would have done. They sometimes use the exact same process that were used 50 years ago. Sally, we've been on several tours over the last few days, and um, something's been in the back of my mind that I really wanted to ask you about. 
Uh, we go into the rooms. There's nothing to prevent people from going up to the tables and actually removing some of the art objects from those tables. <laughs> what is there to prevent them from removing them? Well, I think that's part of uh, the pride of the security up here. There are no barriers between mm -hmm. you and the art, but except there is security. It, but they're not hovering around right. and they're not watching your or you. They don't. You don't think they're watching your every move. At least they they're are there, not. Though. They're there all the time. You bet. They're here for a variety of reasons. If uh, uh, if someone were to become ill on tour, mm -hmm. the security takes care of everybody up here as well. They're protecting the crowd, they're protecting the art, so they're, they're protecting emergent, everything. So they're emergency staff as well. Yes, and they're very much here. In fact, there's a saying around here that the walls have ears. They do. They do. They're <laughs> listening all the time. <laughs> you bet. That's wonderful. Oh, but you know, I don't want us to go too long without discussing another aspect of this hilltop that we're all, we're equally proud of, or, and that's uh, and I think it lends the enchantment again to the hilltop, and that's the gardens. Mm -hmm. The, our head groundskeeper is named Norman Rotanzi, mm -hmm. and he has worked on this hilltop since 1934. Now, wait a minute, that's nearly 50 years. Did he know Mr. Hurst? <laughs> you <laughs> bet he did. He worked for Mr. Hurst before working for the state and taking uh, charge of the gardens. And, you know, the guides go through and they talk about Mr. Hurst gardens, but all of us really know that they're Norman's gardens. <laughs> <laughs> his entire staff, well, each has his own individual area for which he is totally responsible. is so proud his particular area mm -hmm. that uh, the, his reward is that as the crowds go by their O's and ahs uh, make him aware of what a beautiful job he has done so you actually can go on what is that tour number four yes it is it's a spectacular spectacular gardens to look at here it's become a very popular tour but we're very proud of, uh, of the tours that are taken through today. And people who have, were guests here in Mr. Hurst's time, they come up and take a tour, and they're pleased. And I think that's, the, the, that's our best point, of, our best selling point. Hey, we can take somebody who was actually a guest of Mr. Hurst, bring them up on tour, and they can go away saying, hey, it's still the Enchanted Hill. It's still there. It's still pretty, and we enjoyed our day. Well, the state has done a magnificent job. It, the place still has the magic and still has the enchantment that, that uh, Mr. Hurst had and Julia Morgan had, had tried to create up here. I, I still feel it in the air. Beautiful. That's exactly the way I feel, too. Thanks, Sally. I've really enjoyed the tour. And I hope you enjoyed our visit to the Enchanted Hill. For Hearst Castle information, write State Parks, Box 2390, Sacramento, California, 95811.